last presenter is Felicity McCormack. She's an ARC DEFA fellow based at Monash University and a chief investigator of the ARC Special Research Initiative, Securing a Path to the Environmental Future. Thanks very much. So um, I'm an ice sheet modeler, and as we've heard already this morning, um, ice sheet models are not yet incorporated into Access NRI, but as we've also heard, we know that they play a really, really important role in the climate um, and in modulating sea levels. So I'm going to talk a little bit about some of these um, as we go through. So we also know that changes in Antarctica, I'm going to focus particularly on in Antarctica today, although of course we have the Northern Hemisphere and, and Greenland, um, but we know that changes in Antarctica in particular are accelerating um, much more rapidly than we might have thought a few decades ago. Um, the South Pole has been warming about three times the global average, and we know that um, particularly in West Antarctica, we're seeing really rapid ice mass loss from glaciers um, along the Amundsen Sea sector, potentially um, even irreversible retreat in some of those glaciers is occurring already. Um, and we use ice sheet models both to look at these recent changes, but then also we need them to be able to look at how Antarctica might change in the future. And so um, one of the key focuses of my work and of, of many in this room is how Antarctica will contribute to sea level rise. And um, based on the latest estimates from our ice sheet models, we'll see about 12 centimetres of sea level rise from Antarctica alone to the end of the century, although that could increase depending on um, if we were to see um, rapid irreversible retreat um, uh, kick in earlier than, than then. Um, but if you project beyond 2100, we see that the Antarctic ice sheet alone can contribute multiple metres of sea level rise. And so ice sheet models are really the tools that we use to understand um, and to be able to predict um, sea level rise and, and other impacts um, um, from Antarctica as a response to climate change, but they're also really, really important in being able to understand why those things are happening. And so I'm going to talk a little bit about um, how we've used models in this way as I go through. Current state of ice sheet modelling. I guess one of the big challenges in ice sheet models is that um, even though we're looking at um, kind of thousands of kilometres of, of ice mass and how it's moving and changing, it actually is responding at the crystal scale. To, to changes in stress, but it's not going to be feasible for us to model the evolution of single crystals if we want to look at what's going to happen um, to the end of the 21st century. And so um, at the moment, our models use a hierarchy of different physics. We have full Stokes, which is a joke, like Navier Stokes without Navier, um, all the way down to depth averaged um, uh, approximations for the full Stokes equations, which enable us to look at um, questions on timescales of tides, um, say how an ice shelf bends and flexes and, and how its stability is impacted by tides, all the way to these paleo timescales that Nerily was talking about earlier. Um, we're starting to see that ice sheets are, um, are being coupled to other earth systems. So many, again, in the room and, and online have been involved in coupling between different ice sheet models and ocean models. Um, but obviously we, we know that it's not just the ice-ocean interactions that are important. Um, we, we have ice atmosphere and also ice solid earth interactions that are incredibly important. And some research groups are now looking at um, kind of parameterizing, if not um, directly coupling um, the impact of subglacial hydrology, which is a really, really important um, system that influences how quickly the ice is flowing into the ocean. Um, and uh, different models represent these different physical processes to, to, to varying degrees, um, and we know that we've got a lot to work on. So things like basal friction, what's actually happening where the ice meets the bed, and how we parameterize that is, is really critical um, to how rapidly the ice flows. Things like carving is typically represented pretty poorly, if at all, in ice sheet models, and we, need, and we know that different um, ice shelves respond in different ways um, and have different carving laws, and so the key um, areas of, of um, focus in the development of ice sheet modelling at the moment. And I just wanted to talk, I guess, for the rest of, of my time on um, some case studies that are really cool. Ice sheet modellers love puns. Um, and <laughs> so I'll talk you through these case studies now. Um, and just some examples of what we've been doing recently with, with ice sheet models. So one of the key uncertainties in future sea level rise is associated with um, instabilities or these rapid irreversible ice mass loss events. 
and um, and so the configuration that I've got I've got there up in the upper left shows um, what's called the marine ice sheet instability. We know that as the oceans warm and start to melt away at the grounding line where the ice goes from being grounded on solid earth to floating over the ocean. If we find that the bed topography slopes downwards into the interior of the continent, then that um, warming and melting by the ocean can actually lead to um, a runaway retreat. And a re uh, recent studies have, have tried to um, kind of rank or, or look at how different processes and how they're captured by models actually impacts um, the susceptibility of different systems to that, that rapid retreat. So this particular study that I've highlighted here from Schlegel et al. Um, uh, examined a whole range of different ice sheet dynamic processes, as well as things like the bed topography and um, basal melt rates and uh, kind of looked at, at how quickly um, different glaciers around Antarctica responded to, to different parameterizations or um, uh, ways of actually capturing those processes. And not surprisingly um, found that the, the, the way that the ocean melt rate is prescribed and the topography um, are really, really key in being able to predict these rapid mass loss events. Another really interesting thing about this study is that um, it incorporated uh, uh, framework for assessing uncertainty and propagating that uncertainty um, depending on you know the range of parameters that you use um, over you know a hundred years into the ice sheet model run so that's a really um, cool thing that that we can do not just predict what might happen and under what circumstances but give a, a bit more of an indication of the uncertainty estimates associated with that the next thing that um I mean, given that uh, the grounding line is so important, we want to actually make sure that we're, we have good estimates of the grounding line. And actually, less than 12% of Antarctica's grounding line um, has been observed within about a kilometre, which is shocking given how important it is. And so um, another really cool way that we're using ice sheet models is with data assimilation techniques to actually unveil what's beneath the ice. Obviously, we can't directly observe the subglacial environment, and so we need to use um, numerical techniques to, to actually see what's happening there. And this particular study um, used radar-based observations of ice thickness where we have them in a mass conservation method um, to produce a dynamically consistent bed topography that we can now use in our ice sheet models at um, 450 meter resolution, which um, was a real step up um, from, from previous topography that we've used. This technique of data simulation is also really, really important in estimating other physical processes, um, uh, things like basal friction coefficient, for example. And I, you know, it's perhaps um, debatable, but I would suggest that it's essential to use data simulation to um, provide good constraints, um, good in initial conditions for our ice sheet models in the absence of paleoclimate simulations. Um, so uh, yeah, that's something that we that we should definitely be um, considering as we think about ice sheet models that we might want to incorporate um, in a coupled sense. And then finally, um, uh, one of the another really great thing that we can use ice sheet models for is helping to determine where we might prioritize data collection. So it's obviously really costly to get to Antarctica and there are a lot of logistical issues and so being able to use ice sheet models to tell us what data we need and where and at what resolution is really really important. So this is a study that I was working on um, on geothermal heat flow actually and so um, ice is a really great insulator so it might be really really cold at the surface but at the base it can be at the pressure melting point due to frictional heating and geothermal heating um, but we don't really know a lot about um, how geothermal heat flow varies and um, and particularly um, what resolutions matter so this was a sensitivity study where I, um, I used different idealized um, representations of geothermal heat flow at different scales and actually uh, we found that um, for this particular basin in East Antarctica, um, there's a region where it matters to know the geothermal heat flow the most. And that's because the bed is already close to the pressure melting point. And so if the geothermal heat flow is a little bit higher than what we thought, um, it can have an impact on how much the ice is melting in that region. And so using this and then also kind of um, taking out different um, heat producing processes, um, uh, we were able to produce a map that shows where um, where it matters most for us to collect um, measurements of geothermal heat flow. And that can be really important as geophysicists, for example, design seismic, seismic networks um, to actually improve their geothermal heat flow models. 
So the future of ice sheet modelling, um, one of the things that I learned in this particular the study on the particular, the previous slide, is how important multidisciplinary work is. And I know that's a bit of a throwaway line, but we, we have different languages. Um, and, and a lot of ocean and climate modellers are pretty shocked at how rudimentary um, the, the melt rates parameterizations that we use in ice sheet models actually are. And so being able to understand um, what we're doing and what we're not doing in ice sheet modeling and, and how um, we can help each other as communities is incredibly important. This particular schematic is from an um, international initiative, SCAR Instant. They have themes on ice, ocean, atmosphere, earth, um, and, and, and I like it because it has modelers at the center. Um, and, and, and that really speaks to the fact that Modelers are, are really key to interacting with all of these groups as we collect data, we in, improve our understanding of processes, we use those models to predict what might happen in the future, and then we use those models to then go back and, and help um, design kind of experiments in the field or elsewhere. And so these multidisciplinary teams are also really important as we think about um, uh, coupling between ice sheet models and other um, Earth systems components, and that's an area of focus in many international groups. So we're seeing um, uh, ice sheet models coupled to ocean models and, and atmospheric models, um, and some of them have resolved um, ice cavities um, in, in kind of two two way coupling between the ice and the ocean, which is incredibly important, particularly for Antarctica as we look at um, future ice mass loss. And then another a kind of third point there that I think um, is important is just this increase in computational efficiency. So if we use a full Stokes model, for example, which is important, incredibly important to model grounding line advance and retreat, it's also computationally very, very um, expensive. But, um, you know, I hope and expect that um, it will become more, much more tractable to be using, um, you know, those uh, full physics um, as we go forward. And I might leave it there. Yeah. <laughs> I don't think we have questions online. Oh, we have one question online. Thank you, everyone, for being on the time. <laughs> the question online, please. The question is, is ice shelf modeling separate to or part of ice sheet modeling? That's a great question. Yeah, ice shelves are typically represented in ice sheets. So um, I, I kind of think of it more like the distinction between land ice, which is ice that originates on land from the precipitation of snowfall. And then um, we know that that flows out. Um, and so the ice shelves are actually still connected to the um, grounded ice sheet and part of that land ice system. And then of course we have sea ice, which is um, formed from freezing of ocean, which um, di are dynamically different. So. Ice sheet models typically represent ice shelves and ice sheets, um, but not sea ice. And the last question, maybe. It's a sort of a controversial question, uh, Felicity. Um, so th thinking about the state of ice sheet modeling and ice shelf modeling, um, decide that we've crossed a tipping point in the case of Antarctica? Um, well, I guess you probably could talk to that a bit better than I could, Nathan. <laughs> I mean, detection attribution is obviously, you know, an incredibly important method. And it's one that hasn't been widely used in Antarctica because as uh, ice, mod ice sheet models will often say there's a paucity of observation of data to constrain um, our climate forcing. So yeah, but I think we're moving towards that. And actually there's some really interesting initiatives um, looking at the impact of climate variability on ice sheet modeling um, led out of uh, Georgia tech by Alexander Robel. Um, and so I think we'll start to see more of these kinds of studies come out and it's a really important area. And I think that Australia has great capacity to, to play um, into this area as well. Okay, last final one. Hello. Hello, can you hear me? Ben. Hello, good talk there. 
Um, I've got one comment, one question that should make you smile. Uh, just on the on the subject of uh, full Stokes modeling versus not, that it is more computationally expensive, of course, but we find in a couple ice ocean simulations that it's still an order of magnitude less expensive than the ocean. The thing that drives up the cost has got to do with how much resolution you want to run the grounding zones. And, and I think that's not solved. So people are dealing with that overburden pressure problem and that resolution around grounding lines. So that, that's one, that's my comment. Um, my question is, given all of these big gaps in our understanding, what can we reasonably do in the next couple of years to provide improved projections of ice sheet mass loss in spite of the gaps in knowledge? Wow, that's a huge question. And perhaps that's one we can take up in the discussion session later on. But I think that um, I think that there are clear ways ahead for setting priorities. And, you know, I hope that that's something that this community works on. We, I think we've already started to organise and, and have had chats as a Christphere community about what some of those priorities might be. Um, and um, I guess, as I indicated as well, I think it's to answer some of these questions, it's going to be really important to be working um, not just as ice sheet modelers alone, but in in like um, collaboration with oceanographers too. I think I think and and atmospheric scientists, and I think those um, those interdisciplinary groups are are very high priority as as it, as we move forward to, towards um, better projections. <laughs>